it's that time. Well, welcome everybody to our uh, today's strategic farming. Let's talk crops. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we're happy to have joined that you join us today for today's session. And today's session is on cover crops. We've got you covered and talking about the latest research on cover crops and the tools. And today's session is brought to you by, of course, UM Extension and also generous support from the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council and the Corn Growers Research and Promotion Council. Uh, I'm Liz Stahl. I'm an extension educator in crops. I work out of the Worthington Regional Office. I'll be moderating today's session. And we have our speakers today are Dr. Axel Garcia E. Garcia with the Southwest Research and Outreach Center in Lamberton, uh, Dr. Greg Johnson with the Southern Research and Outreach Center in Wasika, and then Dr. Anna Cates with our, she's our U of M Extension State Soil Health Specialist. So uh, just a few housekeeping things before we get started. You know, these sessions are meant to be more of a discussion type format. So we've got guessing about 10 minutes of, of kind of some introductory information from our speakers. We'll each give them a turn uh, just to kind of give some highlights of what they wanted to, uh, you know, give you a little background on what they've been doing. Um, but then uh, we'll have a discussion and we've got some questions that came in at registration. But then also, if you do have any questions, uh, just enter those please into our Q&A box and we'll uh, address all the ones that we can here during the session today. And if you're not familiar with Zoom, you know, just hover your mouse near the bottom of your screen and a toolbar should come up and you'll see this Q&A box. So just click on that. And again, you can just enter the question in there. Uh, if you are having any technical difficulties, uh, you can enter that in the chat too. Just encourage you to do that. Well, we can take questions out of there too, but again, the Q&A box would be the best place to put those questions in if you can. Um, and then also I just want to note too, at the end of this, um, there'll be a very short survey, you know, of course we always have surveys, but just a really short survey once you leave the session, just with three questions. So uh, if you could please take that when you leave today too, but um, also the session's being recorded and we'll have this posted probably within about a week on our website. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Axel and uh, we'll, uh, I think he'll share a screen here too. Okay, uh, thank you, Liz. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Axel Garcia Garcia. I am a sustainable cropping systems specialist in the Department of Agronomy and Plant Genetics. Uh, I am located at the Southwest Research and Outreach Center uh, near Lumberton. Um, I have been working with cover crops into in the corn soybean rotations for about five years so far. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of stuff. Uh, our research is focused on trying to see what will be the ecological benefits of uh, cover crops into the corn soybean rotation. Uh, and, you know, conditions in, in Minnesota are quite special and unique in the, in the sense that uh, we have a very short growing season. And also that uh, because of that, we have a very, uh, very uh, narrow window opportunity to grow cover crops. Still, we have been doing this work and, uh, uh, and one of our main objectives is to try to determine how much uh, help we can get from cover crops in terms of reducing the nitrogen leaching uh, uh, into the crop, uh, corn and soybean uh, rotate into a corn and soybean rotation. So basically because, because uh, sorry, something went, okay. Uh, basically because we know that uh, uh, nit nitrogen uh, leaching is the main responsible for the environmental impact of fertilizer, nitrogen and water quality. And of course, uh, we know that cover crops can help, but uh, we need that those cover crops to grow properly uh, to provide good, uh, biomass. So in other words, so the more biomass, the better it's going to be at certain, until certain point, obviously. Uh, when I see results from other states, for example, going south, it's kind of, uh, I get a little bit jealous because they really do very well. And basically it's a weather related thing. So at times, uh, you know, we, I had to think uh, about our environment in Minnesota as we have to be very precise and very thoughtful on how to conduct uh, or how to have cover crops into the corn soybean rotation. Uh, so when we look at this uh, 
effects that uh, I am particularly interested on. So I have to quantify nitrogen losses, and this is a complex thing, but uh, it's doable. So we need to know at least a couple of things. One is the amount of water that is not uh, being used by the crops and goes beyond uh, you know, the, the, the root system, so which is the drainage water. And then we need to know how much nitrogen in terms of the concentration of nitrogen nitrate is in that drained water. Well, uh, for the first one, for the drainage, most of the time we do not measure that. Uh, drainage is basically uh, estimated. Uh, we do it that using models or, uh, you know, different types of models, I mean, or we can measure sometimes. In fact, the University of Minnesota has uh, two facilities, one at the Southern Research and Outreach Center in Wasika and the other one uh, in Lumberton, where we can uh, actually measure that amount of drainage. Uh, when it comes to the nitrate in the soil solution, if we measure drainage, we get a sample of that water and then we send it to the lab when we have the, the, the nitrate and then uh, we can have the nitrogen load that way that was measured. If not, basically what we do is we install uh, devices such as this one we call ceramic cup uh, at certain depths in the field. This is uh, installed in, in a field in Lumberton at 3.3 uh, feet uh, in the soil. Uh, and uh, as you may imagine, at the bottom of that, what we have is a ceramic cup, which is smaller than a baseball, really smaller than that. Uh, and from there, we have water from the soil getting into the into the ceramic cup. Then we extract that water and we send it to the lab with measure. Well, why I'm saying all that? I'm saying all that because this is a tiny thing in a big field. So it represents just a little bit of the whole thing. And so the variability that uh, you will see with the results is very high. Anyway, so we do that. Uh, and that we know already that, for example, uh, growing cover crops, as I said, is a weather related thing for, for success. Uh, this is um, a study that we have been conducting for already some two, three, three years. Uh, and this is the, uh, the modeling component of that study. What you can see here is the results of that effort. So we, what we did was we planted uh, cereal rye starting in August the 1st all the way through uh, August uh, 15th. You don't see 15 here because growth at in, in October 15th, I'm sorry, was zero. So you can see that uh, no matter when you are uh, seeding a cover crop in the growing season, uh, the variability within the seeding date is going to be very high. Uh, this is in August the 1st, for example, the crop does much better, cereal rye in this case, and as you go into the season, uh, it produces almost nothing. Interestingly, in this slide you can see here, uh, we see uh, cover crops that, uh, you know, at the end of the season, by around September the 20th to the beginning of October. So if you see when we plant cover crops during that period, uh, we should not expect too much biomass. And it makes all sense. Uh, the reason for that is basically because there is no enough uh, condition, good conditions for crops to grow, pretty much any crop. And this is for cereal rye, which is uh, our best, cover crops in terms of uh, winter hardiness, you know? So when we see uh, cereal rye following corn, for example, which will be probably around uh, this time, uh, expect to have in the fall, uh, probably around 600, 700 pounds per acre of biomass at the best. And uh, very close to zero or marginal in several, in many, uh, pretty frequent, okay? Uh, if we were to harvest pretty much any of these uh, cereal rye planting dates uh, in, the, in the spring, we might get as much as 2,500 pounds per acre of biomass. That is significant. But this is specifically for the fall, which is when we have a lot of, a lot of problems. So uh, because of this and the 
overall conditions we have in Minnesota, actually, uh, you can see that uh, basically there is no negative effect of a cereal rye or other cover crops in the corn and soybean rotation. This is specifically for corn, just for the sake of time. And you can see that uh, and this study was, was conducted at three locations, Grand Rapids, Lamberton, and Wasika. Uh, this, the, this stat analysis here was done within a location and uh, within a year. So basically, there is, there is no significant difference between treatments. And the treatments here are uh, cereal rye, cereal rye mixed with crimson clover, cereal rye with crimson clover and forage radish, and the, the pink bar is the treatment or no control. So it's telling us that no matter what we do, uh, if we intercede co uh, cover crops into corn and soybeans, uh, we will have no effect on yield, which is, let's say, a good news. When it comes in terms of the nitrate that uh, uh, we, are, we were talking about, we see that nitrate uh, is affected by the location, uh, probably because of the soil type and rainfall. Uh, the year, this, the, there is a variability on, 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 uh, on weather conditions from, from one year to another. And in this case, it was also affected by the cover crops and then by, by the interaction of the location and the year. So, but uh, if we look at uh, more specifically at the results we got, we can see that we had some significant differences uh, only in some instances. And those is, and those, those uh, significant differences are telling us basically that uh, uh, if we have uh, cereal rye and other uh, cover crop treatments, uh, they might do a little a little bit better job in reducing the concentration of nitrate in the soil. As you can see here, uh, the highest concentration of nitrate in the soil solution uh, is uh, under the the plots where we didn't have cover crops. In other words, if you didn't cover the ground, probably the, the, the possibility of having a higher nitrogen losses is going to be high. Uh, and in locations where we did not have significant differences, uh, we can still see that uh, the, uh, not con the control treatment still has a higher nitrogen nitrate concentration. So that's that's a good news in terms of uh, env environmental uh, impact uh, of the cover crops. And also we did this uh, similar study. Uh, this is in, in Wasika under in, in a field where we can control and measure, uh, we can measure not control uh, the drainage and uh, and we apply different uh, nitrogen rates as well uh, in corn, in the corn, uh, phase of the corn soybean rotation. And we can see that uh, yield was affected by the nitrogen rates, but was not affect, affected by the cereal rye cover crop. And the nitrate wasn't affected by, by, by either cereal rye of end rate and the drainage in either, but drainage, I would expect that that would, that would be the case. And, and the reason for that basically is because you can see that the amount of biomass that we got in Wasika was marginal. This is in kilograms per hectare, but you know, roughly speaking, it could be around 250 uh, pounds per acre of dry mass uh, from cereal rye in the fall and in the spring. So with that very low biomass, I would expect to have no effect on yield of, of uh, corn and soybeans in this case. So these are some of the results from the, my research. Uh, and this is specific uh, results I show you right now are supported by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture from with their Clean Water and Land and Legacy uh, funds and by the Minnesota Corn Growers. And I appreciate their, their support. So we have much more information, but I just wanted to share with you this uh, uh, a little bit of this, and uh, now I am open for questions if, if there are some. All Thank right, you. and thanks, Axel. And we'll have uh, we'll turn it over to um, Greg here next, and then Anna, and then then we'll open it up for questions here. But but thank Sounds you, good. Axel. A lot of a lot of interesting things going on. But yeah, Greg, if you want, I know you had a slide to share here yeah. too. Oh, we'll just go with this. So 
I'm just going to give some very uh, rough overview, but I, I need to preface the, the remarks by saying that when we're looking at cover crops and weeds, this has got to be one of the most frustrating things I've ever done in my career. Um, the, the systems don't play well together. The data sets are really messy. And 90% of the time I'm sitting there scratching my head trying to figure out why something worked or didn't. Um, but we're, we're plowing ahead. We're, we're continuing to do some work. Um, and uh, to, to give you an example of some of the messiness, I guess, is this first point where, you know, we've been previously looking at how cover crops are uh, affecting in-season uh, weed control or weed suppression. And, um, you know, we've, we've planted a number of different crops, um, you know, from rye, radish, uh, clover, pennycress, and we plant them at V2, V7, V12. And then we look at how those are infecting um, uh, weed emergence and weed growth. Um, and, you know, we see every time that, you know, there is some effect of the covers on, on the weed populations, especially when we plant that cover early. Um, but by the end of the season, we really don't have any cover crop at all left um, to, to really add those benefits over, over winter. Um, so there's those trade-offs that are really sort of interesting to look at. But the, the problem with this study, and we've been doing it for a number of years, a um, couple different locations, is, is again, just the, the inconsistency and the variability in these data sets are, are just through the roof. And it's really hard to make any sort of um, or, or construct any trend lines or any conclusions or anything like that. And so we found more consistency anyway at looking at how cover crops are um, suppressing or affecting uh, early season weed control, you know, the following spring. So you're planting that fall cover, um, focusing it on that cover to get it to grow good and robust, and then looking at the effect then of weed control on early emerging weed species like ragweed. And we've had number of successes in that area. Um, and so now we're really focused in on trying to understand why that's occurring. How much biomass do we need to suppress? Are there some predictive models that we can generate to help us determine um, the course of action based on the biomass of weeds that we have? So that's one area that we're really exploring as well as the effect of that residue, the cover crop residue on emerging of, of mid and late season weeds is, is always an interest of us. And then of course, the third uh, point there, um, you know, this whole idea and trade-offs between, um, you know, this, this requisite for us to be able to effectively control the late emerging, the, uh, the tall water hemp's of this world. Um, and we use that with herbicides and that absolutely has to be done, but does that preclude us from planting cover crops? And we're finding it really doesn't <laughs> in some cases, but, but again, there's a lot of variability in that data set. But I think there's some, uh, the, some systems that we can use or we can you know, kill two birds with one stone in, in that context. So, um, so I'm just gonna leave it there. That's very broad, but um, I'm looking forward to the discussion being stuck in my base basement. I really missed that discussion. Um, so I'm anxious to see what others are doing and what they've been finding as well, because I know there are a lot of success stories out there. Um, and, uh, and I would love to know, you know, <laughs> how you're getting those results and what you're doing different than what we are, so. All right, thank, thank you, Greg. And uh, Anna, I don't know, I turn it over to you too. I know Anna wants to highlight some of the tools that we can use to help get started in cover crops. And even if you've been growing them for a while too, and, and uh, yeah, some of the information that's out there. Yes, that's right. Greg, if you can stop sharing, I'm gonna zoom around the internet a little bit uh, in case people aren't aware of some of the resources we have both in Minnesota um, and then also uh, regionally for the Midwest Cover Crops Council. So I'm going to start just on the office of our, um, the website of our office, the Minnesota Office for Soil Health. Uh, the Department of Ag funded a big cover crop 
uh, project that was essentially gathering all the research we've done in Minnesota to try and understand, okay, what do we know about how well cover crops work in Minnesota so far and, and compile into a readable fashion on this website. Um, so you can find information about a lot of different species here that covers those research results. And if you wanna know a little bit more about some species in particular, that's a good place to go. The other things I think are neat on this website are this map of SWCD contacts and resources. That's I have open here in this tab. If you click on whatever county you're in, you get some contact information and a little bit of uh, information from the SWCD or NRCS officer there who might say, well, we've tried these crops and they've worked pretty well so far. So it gives you just the starting point. And then also for people who are interested just in how much cover crops are used across the state. We have a couple maps showing that right now. This is uh, some work from David Mulla that is based on satellite imagery of cover crop emergence essentially. Is it green before you plant corn in the spring? Um, and it shows that we've got from, you know, nothing to five or 6% cover crop use across the state in 2019. And these are subdivided by county or by different watersheds. So you can look at those maps um, <clears throat> or else there's also a map here of how many cover crop acres were funded by uh, government cost share in the last uh, few years. So this is 2015 through 2019 and then again it's by watershed. So you can look around and see kind of where the hot spots are for cover crop use. The other tool I wanted to share was the Midwest Cover Crop Council's uh, updated decision tool. I think a lot of people are using this, but I just want to make sure everyone's aware of how it works. Um, so Midwest Cover Crops Council is mccc.msu.edu. And I picked Minnesota, Clay County. I wouldn't want to pick an easy county for cover crops for the example, right? We want to get up there where it's a, even a little bit harder. You can pick different goals. In this case, I chose erosion fighter because I think that is one of the areas that cover crops really excel in. Axel was talking about the variability in terms of um, uh, nitrate uh, leaching and Greg was talking about the variability in terms of whether they're able to suppress weeds or not. But cover crops, when they're emerged at all, are gonna be better for preventing erosion than having nothing growing on the surface in the fall and spring. So that's why I picked that goal to start with. You could add other ones, um, you know, if you wanted to pick a nitrogen scavenger, for example. You could put in your cash crop options for that year. And that essentially, when you scroll down, gives you this grayed out window. In case you've forgotten when your cash crop will be growing, it puts it right in there along this time scale. And then it essentially lists a bunch of potential cover crop species. And the ones on top of the list are gonna be the ones that are rated highly for the goals that you picked. So alfalfa is rated highly for being both an erosion fighter and a nitrogen scavenger. Um, looking at when you're gonna harvest your corn in this scenario, you don't have a lot of options left for what you're gonna seed. And this gets at the difficulties that Axel was talking about earlier. The other... Um, uh, resource from the Midwest Cover Crops Council that might be of interest is the uh, cover crop recipes. And we right now for Minnesota have cover crop recipes for post corn going to soybean and post soybean going to corn. And Liz and I are kind of actively working on a couple of other options for a post silage and a post canning crop recipe. Those options actually tend to be, um, you know, much better windows, again, for the reasons that Axel talked about earlier. If we have a little bit more time, um, then we can establish cover crops um, and get more of that biomass. Biomass is really key to getting almost all the ecosystem services we're interested in. So that is a metric that we're tracking pretty highly. Um, I'm gonna stop my uh, screen share and just say that uh, in addition, I'm doing some work um, just looking at soil health metrics across the state in different kinds of soil um, management systems, including cover crops, and also looking a little bit on the ability of soil health systems, including cover crops to get you into the field earlier in the spring, which is I think a really unexplored area right now. So we can open it up for questions. All right, great, thank you, Anna. Thank you, everybody. And and I do have, there's a number of questions that have popped up here and we do have some that came in at registration too. So I wanna make sure I get those too. But again, if you have questions, please put those in the Q&A. And Anna, maybe you wanna put the, the links in the chat 
to some of those resources that you uh, highlighted too, so people could look at that. But uh, one of the questions we did get earlier was, you know, what insect pests should we look for after utilizing cover crops for several years? I don't know, Axel, if you wanted to. Uh, yeah, I can. I can address part of. <laughs> yeah, the, the following. Uh, we conducted a. Uh, actually, it was part of this study I was showing at the beginning. Is uh, it was a uh, almost four year study we conducted at three different locations throughout the state. Uh, one location was Grand Rapids. The other, the other was uh, Lamberton, and the third one was Wasika. And we had the cover crops interceded early in the season and late in the season by. Uh, early, I mean, we were uh, inner seeding cover crops at uh, V4 corn, more or less. We did it just for corn for the early inner seeding. And we did monitor pests, uh, parasitoids, and predators uh, in, in corn uh, when we did this study at all three locations. And basically, uh, to summarize, we did not find any uh, effect of cover crops in the insects, parasitoids, and uh, predators populations in the corn. So, but we found uh, differences basically, uh, one, due to location, and two, uh, also uh, due to uh, the timing of the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the data collection. Okay, so for example, uh, I, I, I got a note here in front of me. Um, we, we tended to see more pests in Lamberton, uh, followed by Wasika, and then less in, uh, in Grand Rapids. But that was, we didn't find any significant differences uh, within a location. So uh, I hope that helps uh, to, to this question, but uh, this is all I have. And similar things happen with parasitoids and uh, predators. So no difference at all when we use uh, cover crops. Okay, all right, thanks Axel. And there's a number of questions coming in here about herbicides too. So uh, maybe uh, Greg, I'll have you take a stab at this one first and any of can join in on this too. But uh, some of the questions are, you know, if you wanna try to well, I'll kind of rephrase this a little bit. Do you think you could decrease or eliminate herbicide use if you wanted to do that with cover crops? Uh, but also, you know, there's questions too. Yeah, can, should we modify our programs to prevent injury to cover crops? Long, you know, less long residual herbicides that can all kind of go together. Yeah. So uh, yeah, there's <laughs> that's a complicated one to ask. But um, you know, I think we have to consider. Um, and, and I think we all know this, we have to consider cover crops as, as a tool. It's, it's not, um, you know, the end in of itself as far as, as weed control. Um, and given the variability that we're seeing, um, just simply due to, to environmental differences, uh, the effect of that cover on weed is gonna be different from year to year. So the, the consistency in response to covers on weeds is just a, a, a bit too risky for me right now to say that, that that's, you know, can be used as a, as a high priority weed control tool, but it is the start, start of, a, um, of an integrated, you know, package. The other thing that makes covers, is, and I, I see that in one of the other chats too, is, um, you know, if you do choose to go with, with a mix, you are sort of eliminating a number of herbicides uh, for rescue treatments if, if something does come through. So, um, and then, and then just trying to deal with that trade-off between, um, you know, early mid weed control that cover crops seem to do okay on as far as suppression, uh, but then especially in corn, they just water out to the end of the year, so you're losing the benefits of that cover, you know, over the winter. So there's a lot of trade-offs and a lot of things to to think about, um, but you know, I think we're that that's one of the things where I'm really quite worried about is the um, sort of the, this tall water hemp and God forbid Paul Amaranth coming on um, people trying to um, uh, force covers into the system when our when our priority should be those weeds and trying to get those weeds under control. Um, and then one last comment I'll make is I think cover crops will work a lot better, and I've seen this, um, in fields that have low seed bank pressure. 
Um, they tend to really, uh, you know, sort of shine in those situations. Um, so if you get your weeds in, under control, get the seed bank densities down, that's a good place to start slowly integrating these covers in uh, on more of an integrated weed management strategy. All right, thanks, good, yeah, and, and oh, did, oh, go ahead, Anna. Can I just add to that, that you're essentially describing an organic weed control system, right? And there are benefits to that, but there's risks to that too. An organic system where weed control is poor tends to have very poor yields. So if you're going to move into an organic system like that, I would think of it, go through a deliberate organic transition process where you try to break down that weed seed bank through a perennial crop or yep. something like that. And then think of it as an organic system and hopefully certify so you can get the price premium that pays off that risk that you're taking. Right. right. Like, yeah. And, and I can add a note here too. There's a question wondering about like uh, post-emergence application on soybeans, you know, cereal rye. Yes. That has been one of the more tolerant species when people have looked at cover crops. Doesn't mean that it's not going to ever be affected, but overall, most of the research trials it has, been pretty much unaffected by the pro most of the products that they've looked at, but I wouldn't say that it won't affect it. Um, and there is, I'll put a link in here in the chat too, as some of the herbicide, you know, we do have some information on our website to help guide that. And there's been some university research on that, but, but, uh, but yeah, they, they can have an impact. Uh, some of the brassicas, yes, have been hurt, but um, you know, all, all the species have the potential to be affected some less than others, depending what you use. Um, but here's a question too, another one that came in earlier, but it ties to some of the ones we've been getting as well. Um, how, you know, what's some of your recommendations on getting a cover crop established in the fall? You know, what would be some of the key tactics you recommend and planning date would be one of those too. Um, if, if anybody wants to maybe actually want to take a stab at that first here. Uh, yeah, well, basically this is about what we were talking in uh, previously. Uh, obviously our main challenge here is uh, our weather conditions, but yes, uh, timing is the most important thing. So uh, generally speaking, the earlier we, we see cover crops, the better it's gonna be. But specifically in the, into the corn soybean rotation, the issue we have is that uh, we might prefer to see those cover crops after harvest. And the reason for that is because we are looking, uh, you know, to, to ensure a, a, a better success, we are looking at a better uh, seed to soil uh, contact. And uh, if we uh, broadcast seeds, uh, you know, using, for example, you know, aerial seeding or something like that, that's not guaranteed. Uh, so that will be the first thing. Uh, obviously then the seeding method is another one. So I would prefer drilling uh, the cover crops than air seeding. But the, I do realize that uh, air seeding is probably the most uh, you know, practical method when we are talking in large areas. Uh, but when it comes to that, and actually it was a question about uh, how much seed we should use. I mean, the seeding rate if we are air seeding. So, I don't have a response for that because I don't work with air seeding. But what I do know is that basically we have to put much more seed. I would say that I usually use no more than 65 pounds per acre when we are drilling. And we could even use less than that. I have used uh, 30 pounds per acre and has worked. But uh, if we are gonna be air seeding, uh, we should probably be doubling the, that amount. But uh, I, I never work with air seeding. But anyway, so for uh, how to get cover crops growing in the fall uh, is challenging. I would say that probably uh, we should try to get our seeds established as early as possible if, if in the corn soybean rotation. Uh, either you know after harvesting or inner seeding at the end of the season for both crops uh, and also try to make sure that we have a good uh, seed to soil contact and um, and then depends on the weather so we need a good soil temperature and a little bit of uh, of, of uh, wetness uh, rainfall in this case so we will have that cover crop established otherwise uh, you might forget it but uh, cereal rye which is our toughest uh, cereal cover crop uh, here uh, for sure is going to come up in the in the spring even if it doesn't emerge in the fall right and if thank I you could follow oh, one additional comment uh, Axel too I think tillage plays a role in You're right. Established method. 
Um, you know, I know I've seen a number of uh, grower fields where they've been doing strip till, no till. And I think uh, either either going in with, with a high boy or aerial, it just seems to take better um, in those situations versus, um, you know, more of a conventional uh, field. So I just throw that out there. We've got a yeah. comment in the chat here too. The drill should chase the combine. Yep, <laughs> from an experienced uh, goer. Yep, that's that's good. And uh, and I'll note here, we are past our nine o'clock time. So I mean, if you wanted to just be on at nine, you know, you're welcome to to head you know head out here. But we do have a lot of questions. So our you know speakers, we're gonna keep working through uh, a bunch of these and try to get through as many as we can. So I uh, can stay on, that's great. But if you can't, thanks for joining us today. But um, I just wanted to make sure I interjected there. I do have some more questions though with, um, you know, seeding timing. So let's say you wanted to seed after peas or sweet corn um, or after corn silage, how early can you seed rye? Anybody want to tackle that? Um, I don't know, Anna, you've worked with the cover crop decision tool too. Maybe you've got some recommendations with that. Yeah, and I just worked with um, a couple of SWCD people who work with canning crops a lot on developing a recipe for canning crops. And we didn't recommend interseeding into sweet corn uh, because you have enough of a window after harvest to plant. And also the uh, harvest process can be pretty destructive and compacting. So it's ideal probably to wait till afterward. Um, and it's going to decrease your seeding expenses also. Uh, that was the main gist of that question, right? That was like, yeah, whether you're to interseed or not in the sweet corn. Yep. So, yep, that one. And then how about, you know, timing? Do you have like a... How early? How early it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, um, if you're not going to interseed, then your timing is just going to depend on, on when your harvest happens, right? Uh, and yeah. when you think about going super early in the season, like with these interseeding mixes, then you're thinking more about something that's shade tolerant and will grow during the, the summer, a warm season species versus the cool season species like cereal rye, we focus on for anything after August 15, I would say more or less. What would you guys say? Yeah, can I jump into it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, if you are following sweet corn or peas, that's um, probably is one of the best ways to get cover crops established in the state, okay? Because we're still having lots of time after we harvest those, those crops. Uh, I would probably say that uh, watch at the weather forecast to make sure that uh, after you drill your cover crop seeds, uh, you are gonna have a good rain or at least a little bit of uh, rainfall within the next uh, three, four days. That, so that will help for the establishment of those cover crops. Uh, the other thing is that uh, probably those crops are gonna be harvested. Well, sweet corn varies, but let's say not later than the end of uh, July, beginning of August, uh, we've seen that uh, seeding around 15th to the end of uh, August might, might work well, but uh, we have been quite successful as well when we see it uh, around not later than 15th of, of September in terms of establishment, right? Uh, another story is how much biomass those crops can make before uh, you know the winner gets established or after a couple of uh, frost days. Hmm. Well, and here's There's another point. comment in there about June 15th being too early. If you're looking at June 15th, uh, moisture for establishment again over the summer is gonna be important. And also I think including something that has warm season growth capacities exactly. is important. Yes, uh, June 15th for cereal rye, I, I wouldn't uh, recommend that. It's way too early. Cereal rye is very sensitive to, 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 hot, to a hot environment. Uh, remember that cereal rye is a winter crop and it does much better with you know mild conditions. We have planted cereal rye early uh, in the season. It, it just does very poorly. Uh, annual ryegrass does much better in that case but that's another story. And I'll put in a plug for a project that Axel and I have been working on at Lamberton too. And I know some other educators in other county too, you know, like prevent plant situations. We've been looking at different species planted like in, in mid season too, and just like sorghum sedan grass. I know this is a, going off on a tangent here, but that just tremendous biomass compared to like cereal rye planted, you that's know, in the middle of July. But but that's something, yeah, we're, we're working on uh, yet too. So, yeah. um, and kind of going with this, uh, another question was, you know, we're really dry right now. Um, 
are you concerned about cover crops affecting moisture? What about stand establishment uh, this fall too? But uh, have, have we seen anything where cover crops, you know, it's competition, you know, they can take moisture. I don't know how, a lot of wet well, seasons. But. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I've been looking at that and we are actually writing a paper about water use of cover crops. Uh, and we ha we've seen consistently Obviously, cover crops use water as they use nitrogen and other nutrients uh, because they are growing, but we have consistently seen no effect of cover crops. In, how to put this? We have seen that the water the cover crops use does not affect the performance in, of corn and soybeans. And there are several reasons for that. One is because cover crops grow very little, so they produce very little biomass uh, by the time we terminate them. So the amount of water that those cover crops use to produce, to make that biomass is not as much. That's one thing. The other is that uh, in the southern part of the state, we have heavy soils and the, the capacity of those soils to, to you know, to, to have, uh, I'm looking for the word, uh, you know, to, to have enough water is, is really very high. You know, the water holding capacity of the soils is very, very high. Sorry, that's what I was looking at. So uh, basically, if we get a little bit of rainfall so within the days corn and soybean were planted, we will basically be like, we will be zeroing it, what happened with this, the, the cover crops. I will be just okay with that. This is for conditions in Minnesota. I'm saying that because I already noticed that we have some international participants as well. Uh, in dry environments, that's another story because in dry environments, we have to eventually provide water to that new crop, which is a cover crop. Mm -hmm. But for conditions in the Southern part in much part of the state of Minnesota, if it's not a, uh, uh, a soil that, is, if it's not a sandy soil, we are okay, no problem. And I see some comments on the chat here too, you know, people, again, how cover crops do, like you say, it's very dependent where you're at, what yep. works in Missouri or further south, we just may not work so hot here, you know, that's why, because again, it's just, yeah, the moisture, the environment, and uh, again, that's been really striking that Prevent Plant Project, just how much that biomass can differ by species, depending on the planting date. Um, I've got some other questions here too. A lot of them keep popping up. But how about what's your feeling on cover crop mixes? Does anybody have enough that you have a recommendation for that? Or I know a lot of our work's been on single species, but what, what um, is the question? Well, it says, do you have a cover crop mix you like for planting after wheat uh, going to corn the following year? And there's, you know, they're looking at West Central Minnesota, but but um, I think a lot of our work has been more single species to date, but and maybe Anna too. I know you've done a lot of stuff with mixes, but yeah, I guess I would. Um, you have a big window after wheat, so you have some options. Um, your volunteer wheat, if it's coming back, that can totally work for you in this context. If you're going into corn, you might not want a lot of heavy rye biomass, for example, after that. Um, so I would say plant a sort of a not too diverse mix in order to keep your seed costs under control, but put in something like a turnip or a radish. Um, if you really want to generate some nitrogen and you can get it in and get it established well, you can try a legume like a clover or something, but um, you just, uh, I would I would say you don't have to have seven species. You could have three and get some mixed benefits from that. Yeah, yes. Good, good point. Think yeah. about like a, a grass and a broadleaf for sure. Think about whether or not you want to uh, get nitrogen out of it. And, yeah, make that decision that way. Yeah, actually, that's very interesting. Um, I happen to work with wheat. But I do. It. I have done mixes uh, of cereal rye with crimson clover and forage radish uh, following corn. Uh, Yes, we have several instances where the three-way mix produces more biomass, but uh, there is no significance. In many other instances, basically that uh, species richness does not translate into more biomass. It's just the same as a single monocrop cover crop. Okay, and I have another question. And Greg, I'm gonna shoot this one your way because of your weed science background here. And, and I bet Axel might have something to add to here too. But uh, have you done, well, what about, have you done research with delayed termination of cereal rye and soybean to allow more biomass to accumulate? You know, I know not to do that in corn. You just wanna 
kind of address that a little bit? I know, you know, Excel's worked on a project, but from a weed science perspective, what, what are your thoughts on that with a delayed termination? Soybeans versus corn, you know, how yeah. late would you do that? And Well, I can, I'll take a stab at here and then Axel can weigh in, but. Oh, I think Greg froze up a little bit. There. Yeah, he froze up. <laughs> but, but there's some trade-offs, okay. you know, it's, it's, yeah. It's, you know, we always say the rule of thumb on rye is terminate at boot. Otherwise you have some problems with it re-emerging and coming back. But, you know, so that has to be uh, looked at as well. Uh, the competition with those, with those beans, you know, the moisture and all those um, components have to be looked at as well. But, um, you know, I, we, we always tend to, to like I said, uh, in beans anyway, we terminate it boot and um, intercede and the system works really nice. Um, we seem to have a, enough biomass at boot anyway to get it um, to a point where we are providing some, some suppression from not only the residue, um, but also having that crop in there, having that, that, um, that cover in there a little bit longer. But, um, you know, I see one, uh, Ryan had said, um, you know, he's getting a little worried about it, you know, that sort of system. Um, and, and that's sort of where I'm at too. We've had some successes, but I'm always just a little worried. We're going to hit that year where it's not going to, it's not going to work out real well for us. But, um, yeah, I, I always, I just keep things at boot and be done with it and it works. Yeah. And, and talking on successes, I guess it was Ryan who was asking, um, you know, related to weather, um, how how much do we know how how successful we can be over time with uh, you know cover crops in Minnesota, or City of Rye, I guess he was asking for. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of vari interannual variability. Uh, there is a study by Jeff Strzok and others that was published in 2004, I guess. Uh, they said that they saw success of City of Rye uh, one every four years. Uh, I guess they are quite close to that. Uh, but I have seen as well that uh, as time passes and we know a little bit more about how this cereal rice specifically works and all those things, uh, we, we might be uh, more successful or successful much, much more often. But they are probably quite right in the one over four years. And I guess I would add just that that depends on how you're defining success, right? If you're defining success as measurable weed control, you probably have less chance of success versus if you're defining it as ground cover to prevent erosion, keep your soil in place and build structure, that's more likely to have a lower threshold in terms of biomass yeah. and see success more frequently. Um, and like anything in farming, uh, there's some risk and adaptive management where something that works some years is going to work less well other years. Some years you may think, gosh, it is super dry out there. I need to terminate this cover crop now before it takes up any more of my soil water. Other years you're like, gosh, let this thing grow to four feet tall and take up all the water it can so I could drive out there to plant my crop. It's just uh, being adaptive. Uh, I think somebody put that in the chat uh, too. Um, yeah, depending on what your goals are, is important. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, uh, Liz. Uh, yeah, the, go ahead. Well, it's, I, I think we also have the technology now available to us to gather the information that we need to be um, very reactive in our decisions and very timely in our decisions, as as far as is the points that Anna brought up. So yeah. Nice. Uh, Liz, yep. could I uh, address a question that came from abroad? Actually, I just want to take the opportunity that we are having international att attendance. So uh, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I looking at the Q&A uh, part, I noticed that there is uh, someone from Pakistan attending our talks and uh, the person uh, put a question there and his question, uh, his name is Muhammad and his question was uh, whether or not using uh, fertigation through p uh, center pivot or uh, drip irrigation will help reducing uh, nitrogen losses. Uh, well, uh, I don't, I, do, I no longer work with irrigation, but I used to in my previous job. Uh, 
and I did this 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 work uh, at that time. Basically, yes, the response would be yes. Uh, if you switch from let's say flood irrigation or surface irrigation to pivot, center pivot or uh, drip irrigation, that would be much better for several reasons. Uh, one, because you are going to apply less water. Uh, but the amount that the crop needs. And the other is because you will be able through fertigation to apply those fertilizer uh, nutrients when the crop needs it. And within between those two center pivot or drip irrigation, I would say that drip irrigation will be the best because it will allow you to basically drip the amount of uh, uh, nitrogen that the crop needs at basically even more than once a day if you want it. So it will considerably reduce the amount of nitrogen that is lost in the environment. That's basic. Thank you, Axel. Yep, I was going to get to that one. So you okay. beat me too. That's good. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and and I just want to go back a little bit to this, again, uh, Ryan's question here. I think just trying to look at this planting green concept, I think, too, again. So yes, we, we do have some trials looking at planting green. Um, you know, excellent. I put, put a little bit together. I know some other people have been looking at different things as well. And just to summarize in general, what I think people have seen so far with soybeans, you've got a little more leeway. You know, maybe you could terminate it maybe a week to two weeks after planting your crop, you know, terminate the rye and not see a yield impact, you know, generally. Uh, but you know, with corn, more risk with that too. So um, doesn't mean that there's never been a yield loss. I mean, other states have have looked at this as well. But that's so it's kind of generally, you know, we don't have a lot of trials on that, but that is what we've seen so far. Hopefully, that works with that. There, um, I do have a question here too, wondering about anybody know anything about you know soybean aphids? Um, have you noticed a reduction in aphid infestation in soybeans when? Uh, planted green and a growing cover and terminating the cover about 10 to 14 days after planting. I know there's been some work done, uh, try, you know, they're looking at that over the north central region, but I haven't really seen much for results on that yet either. I don't know if anybody else has any information on that here. Um, I don't actually. Okay. Yeah, so that's one. Uh, again, I know there's some work being done with that over the north central region, but um, don't have information on that yet. Um, and one of the other ones here too, let's see, do you think there exists a cover crop strategy in Southern Minnesota that can pay for itself or will they always be a stewardship tool? Uh, what are the most promising types of cover crops with regards to economics? So this kind of gets the whole economic thing. And I think that ties with what you're talking about, Anna, too, what your goals are. So if you kind of want to comment on the economics, I'll just throw that out to everybody here. Yeah, I was I guess excited I to see this because uh, I literally spent the early hours this morning reading a thesis from a master's student analyzing the economics of cover crops back and forth. <laughs> so it's Good. kind of on the tip of my brain. She developed this cool spreadsheet that I'm really excited to get out there via blog post as, so that everybody can play with this. And it essentially shows that in the establishment year, cover crops are just going to be a cost. And that at least one year or probably about three years of cost share in the like 20 to $30 an acre realm can make it pay off in the five year and 10 year range based on some data that shows that you do see some yield increases with cover crops, but not right away, probably in the five and 10 year range. That's based on a SARE study I can link to when I'm done talking here. Um, but it's really interesting to show that um, some cost share, some support can really get you over that hump of the initial establishment costs. Uh, and you can tweak some different things in terms of your tillage system and whether you expect savings in uh, herbicide or fertility or that kind of thing. Uh, but really, it's got to be a long term strategy. And I always recommend that growers apply for uh, any kind of support they can get in order to get them over the learning curve. Thanks, Anna. And uh, anybody else want to take a little bit about the economics or? Well, just one. So this is really reaching here. But um, so as as we're been getting to approach this question, I, I down the road, I think there's going to be some value assigned to these systems from the standpoint of um, carbon from um, sustainability. There's, you know, you've seen the trends in 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 uh, the food industries now wanting to source material from, you know, low low carbon sources. Um, 
sustainability indexes, all these things, um, I think will ultimately add value to the cash grain crop by incorporating uh, cover crops is really where they're going with this. So um, I think there'll be some opportunities for profit there as well. Yeah, and uh, someone was putting there, I guess it was Jared, uh, that uh, we should also look at uh, the, the, the forage value of the cover crops. That's a very good point as well. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I guess that's what uh, Anna and Greg, uh, it is what Anna and Greg was talking, we're talking about, you know, to put value to cover crops is not that simple. We need time and the time is key in this case. So we will see those, uh, the return that we are looking at. I, I am hoping that uh, eventually we will come up with something that will also give us some credit for the nitrogen that uh, might eventually come from the, you know, the mineralization of the, you know, of the residue of those cover crops, but we are still working on it. Yeah, and I think, and yep, Jared's thinking the same way. Yeah, I mean, I think right now, the easiest way to pencil cover crops right now is if you're gonna graze that cover crop. Yep. Because you are getting that forage value. My yep. thing is just always make sure you're watching what herbicides you're using in that system so that you're not having any issues with residual products, you know, uh, that you're on label with everything. That's a, just a challenge with, with uh, grazing a cover crop because they're not always on the label. So maybe more limited in what you can use. But yeah, that's that's been the number one way where people really can pencil it out in the shorter term right now. Um, and let's see, anything else here? Oh, and just a little bit more about planting green. Anything about water hemp pressure being less or more when planting soybeans into a green cover crop? And before I forget, um, yes, there's a comment in here too about somebody seeing, you know, like a 10 bushel decrease with a late terminated plot versus early terminated crop that was with corn. Yeah, planting green into corn is risky. Um, I've seen, I think about every study that I've looked at has shown a yield decrease with planting green with corn. Yeah, that comment uh, is, is really good because that's yeah. right, yeah. And you have potential issues with like true army worm coming in too. Uh, I've seen plots of that where that's been really, uh, had a bad bad impact too. So. You know, again, that that's a really tough one to, to I wouldn't recommend planting green into corn, um, but uh, soybeans, you do have an option. But again, planting the later you go, the higher risk area of a, of a yield loss. But um, yeah, so with water hemp, do you think planting green can help us out with that? Maybe I'll shoot that by. That's kind of the project, the reason for one of our trials, right, Greg? <laughs> Good yeah, plug for that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, the, the trouble with water hemp uh, is a it's a, it's a, it tends to be a late emerger and it also has a very long emergence period. So um, I think planting green, you know, soybeans into into rye will definitely reduce that that first flush of of, of water hemp. I, I've seen that and it, and it, it does do that. Uh, but, but again, the problem is those subsequent flushes of water hemp that, that tend to be more problematic anyway, um, that, that we're most concerned about. Um, we are, and I wish I had an answer, but I just don't, but we're doing that right now as we're looking at the effect of that residue once you've terminated the rye, the effect of that residue on um, subsequent emergence of tall water hemp. So it's effect on soil moisture, soil temperature, and if that residue doesn't provide a little bit of a barrier to, to reduce the emergence in the later flushes, which I, I think it will, but um, you know, you're sort of running a fine line there. Oh, the, another comment, early termination of the shield around the corn did not have a yield reduction. Um, this was planted and then terminated the next day and had a four bushel benefit over no cover crop plots. Okay, this is kind of a follow up on that, but yeah, terminating after planting in corn can is, is has been riskier overall and, and lots of things. Now, in the last question here, I'm not really sure what this was. I you probably see that Axel. I think that was that came up when you were presenting. Um, I'm wondering if it was interseeded or seeded the prior fall. So I don't know what POW can can you can you read the question, please? I was was this POW as this Oh, I, I guess it's about whether or not the the, the results I showed came from uh, inner seeded cover crops. Yes, uh, that study that study was for inner seeding cereal rye and the mixes uh, 
at uh, R5 to R6, which is uh, dent to maturity corn, and R7 to R8, uh, which is when the soybean starts to get uh, re close to maturity as well. So we're inner seeded. All right. Okay. Um, so I think we are at 930. So lots of great comments, lots of great information. We do have a lot of research projects that are going on yet right now too. And um, always looking for more funding to get more of those done too, right? Got to put on a plug for that because there Me certainly too. is a <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. And um, so let's see. Yeah, we'll have, like I said, when you leave, there'll be a short survey at the end. Um, so if we really do appreciate you filling that out. We do need that for reporting purposes and everything. It also helps give us good feedback as to uh, you know how this went and, and what we can do in the future. And again, thanks to our sponsors, the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council and the Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council. Uh, next week's program, that'll be again, same time on adjusting soil pH to maximize crop production. And that'll be with Dan Kaiser and Jeff Vetch. So thanks again for our panelists and thank you everybody for attending today. Um, really, yeah. really great conversation. We'll have a recording of this available on our strategic farming website too. So have a great rest of the day. Yeah, thank you very much. Good to see you guys. Bye everyone.